PowerPoint. Thank you. Well, I, don't see your, I don't see your kids. Here we go. I believe you're on slide eight. Here we go. I think it should be there now. Yep. Very good. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. Oops. Okay. Well, thank you. I got that fixed. And that was some of the questions I was seeing about that as well. Okay, so we solved those questions. Uh, would anybody else like to? I would love to. We'd love to hear what some other models are for for programs that are uh, participating. If you want to, I can unmute you, and you could tell us about how old your mentors are, and where they meet, and what sort of structure you're using. This is Allison from Virginia Great. Mentoring Hi, Partnership. Hi, Allison. How you doing, April? Good. Do you have a new baby? Not yet. It's October. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for that aside. Um, I did want to ask or tell you that we have been doing a lot of peer mentoring, a lot in the schools, and um, setting, helping with programs. And we have um, high school students mentoring um, ninth graders. We have. And high school students mentoring middle schoolers. We have um, high school students mentoring uh, children of promise, you know, in um, more at-risk neighborhoods. And um, we have um, high upperclassmen mentoring um, underclassmen. All those models are being used, and, uh, and, and we've been training those. Great. And it looks like Sutina. <laughs> it says her program is going on in the background, so she can't talk. But, And then Lisa says her program matches teens with developmental disabilities to peers without, all between the ages of 13 to 18, and they're also community-based. Great. I just want to give a second, see if anybody else pops their hand up. Well, feel free to share at any point. Oh, here's another one. Uh, running a program at Hamlin University, my alma mater, or this is Jane, uh, that mentors middle and high school youth. So I'm matching college students with middle and high school youth. I assume that's what that means. Great. Yes, it does. OK. So in the brief, then, it kind of we walk through a little bit about that cross-age mentoring is typically um, with high school-aged youth paired or matched with elementary or middle school-aged children. And, um, and that meetings almost always take place in the school context, although some of us might think of um, plenty of other places where that kind of older youth to younger youth mentoring might take place. Um, I know with my camp background and uh, I often would train my counselors and, and staff to think of themselves as some really intensive mentoring over the course of the summer. And I know that those campers probably think of those counselors as, as mentors. Uh, but some of those shorter duration pieces. But to think about that this article and this research is focusing primarily on those one-to-one -one relationships between teenage mentors and younger mentees. And um, Dr. Karcher noted that, you know, one of the reasons is that descriptions and, and evaluation data on programs in other contexts are rarely reported in the research literature, so it's hard to, uh, you know, measure the impact of those programs or how their practice may vary from setting to setting. Um, also, there, there were no reports of cross-age peer mentors working with multiple youth in a group mentoring format. Um, in the literature search conducted. So if anybody is doing a group mentoring program that's matching um, high school age students with a group of kids, then uh, that may not be um, covered here just because there was no nothing in the in the literature, which the circle program that I did the first summer we did it, we did match uh, students, high school students with more than one student, but not necessarily that they were intended to meet together as a group. 
Um, so it wasn't by design. It was just we were trying to match as many as possible and totally overloaded those high school students as well. But uh, anyway, so we're generally talking about one-on-one, -on -one, typically in the school context, because um, those are most commonly reported. That's typically where it takes place. Um, but about duration is that most are meeting weekly for an hour or two for the duration of the school year. Um, and I thought this was interesting that the meetings often occur within a larger group, you know, where they might all be in one location at a school um, in, in some, and often engaging in some group-based activities for all or part of the meeting. So, um, you know, with my one experience with a cross-age mentoring program, I didn't necessarily think of it that way and, and thinking about that that's, um, you know, in the literature how most of those programs are taking place. And uh, just to get a, a sense of the scope of cross-age mentoring, uh, you know, thinking about the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, that the high school bigs program, uh, which is their cross-age model, uh, comprises nearly a fourth of all of their matches um, annually. So 41% of school-based matches are with high school volunteers. And thinking that they served nine, uh, 95 in 2003, 95,000 youth in school-based programs. So about 39,000 of those youth were being served by high school volunteers. Um, and thinking that that number is growing, and probably from your own experiences, realizing that uh, those numbers are will continue to grow as well. And there are some, you know, the 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 brief here, and help me out here if you want, uh, uh, Michael. But the saying that the school-based peer-driven structure, um, the article says, has several elements which make it very appealing to mentees, mentors, and school staff, and I think we can probably fill in the blanks on what some of those elements are, but which explains some of that rapid proliferation. Last month we talked about school-based mentoring, and some of those things might be similar, that you've got uh, mentors on site or thinking about a group of, of, of uh, you know, a captive audience to recruit from, or if there's interest of, you know, from the high school students uh, to be mentors, um, that you can do it in the, in the middle of the school, school day, perhaps, or that there's that proximity. Um, some other pieces for uh, parents, uh, there's a note that for youth whose parents may be um, wary of or unwilling to seek out an adult mentor, for an adult mentor for their child, that the school-based cross-age peer mentoring might be a little less threatening to them, or thinking about that they might, you know, maybe they, sometimes we have this idea that mentors are you know, taking the place of a parent, but if this is sort of, oh, they really need a big brother or a big sister, then having it be a high school student might be more like that. But, um, and then as we've said with pretty much every one of the Research in Action webinars that, um, and this is the whole idea of bringing all these, this practice and research together, is that as with the mentoring field as a whole, the practice of cross-age mentoring uh, has outpaced research, and so there may be um, a lot of understructured um, cross-age mentoring programs out there. So we'll talk about some of the best practices or recommendations for that. Okay, so the first, the next section really looks at how do we define cross-age peer mentoring. And, and so some of that we talked about, but really thinking about some of the distinctions that are important when thinking about what is a cross-aged peer mentoring program, uh, and spending a lot of time in this first distinction of, of what, is the, what is the structure of the program and, and distinguishing between a tutoring and mentoring program, or um, considering what's the, what are the goals of cross-age peer mentoring. Uh, and, you know, just important to note that, and we've covered this distinction between the, the prescriptive uh, or instrumental mentoring, and those are different things. And, and more of a developmental uh, approach or goals, more of the, the, where the relationship is the goal of the program as opposed to some of the other academic outcomes, perhaps. And so, you know, that tutoring can happen during mentoring, but that the relationship in the youth's development um, becomes is the primary goal. So, but there are a lot of 
mentoring programs in general, but cross-age mentoring programs too, that have this academic focus or an instructional or goal focused where then the mentoring outcomes maybe um, wouldn't be as uh, positive. So, um, you know, noting the prescriptive mentoring described by Morrow and Stiles, also the apprenticeship-like instrumental mentoring described by Hamilton and Hamilton, uh, and then thinking about the more developmental approach, which is what, uh, again, like a Big Brothers Big Sisters, the high school bigs really focus on the relationship development, helping mentees understand value and importance as people, facilitating character development, um, and so it, referring to cross-age mentoring as developmental, developmental mentoring reinforces that distinction, also helps to frame the role of the supervising adult um, within a developmental rather than a remedial framework, so whoever's supervising the program or running that program, um, and also em emphasizing then that both the mentor and mentee can meet their developmental needs through that relationship. So um, we'll talk about some of the, you know, we don't often talk about the impact of mentoring on the mentors, sometimes overlooked, but in cross-age peer mentoring, because we're talking about youth, uh, we think about that a little bit more. Uh, and, you know, even within that structure then too, so thinking that, you know, we're relationship focused, but that in cross-age peer mentoring, most of the programs, or almost all of the programs, provided a curriculum of some sort or some sort of structure to help guide the cross-age peer matches. And, um, you know, and in the field of youth mentoring in general, there's a suggestion that structure could potentially double the impact of most mentoring programs. So knowing that structure is important to any kind of mentoring program, uh, you know, that it might be particularly important for our cross-age mentoring programs as well. Okay. April, I was going to add something yeah, please. about structure. I think one of the things that makes the cross-age mentoring programs a little more challenging is that um, when you think about how to structure a, an adult with child mentoring program, you can sort of think about what's in the best needs of the mentee and tell the mentor, you know, we seem to find that um, taking this developmental approach is more useful or that in this case the structure might be more helpful. But in the cross-age peer mentoring, uh, the benefit is also the, the drawback in a sense where we really have to think about what the high school mentors are needing from the experience. And one of the things that stands out is that the high school kids may benefit more from uh, educationally oriented activities because they feel more efficacious. They feel more effective because they can understand what they're doing. They can see how it would help the child. And developmentally, it's just harder for the high school kids to really grasp how they are putting money in the relational bank by being a friend and listening. Mm -hmm. So I think in some ways, adding structure is much more important for the cross-age mentoring programs for reasons that we'll talk about later. Uh, mm -hmm. But thinking about um, what the high school kids need and want to get out of this, both need to feel effective and the need sort of socially or developmentally to make this fun for them, uh, presents another challenge that most programs really need to think through carefully. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, and so also thinking about the important distinctions of that, that Michael points out in the brief for duration, um, the focus and approach, and... Uh, and sort of the nature of it, whether it is cross-age mentoring. And I'm just going to pop up. I have another slide with a table that was that's in the brief as well, um, just to give us something else to look at while we're talking through these. But um, so the other distinction, thinking about duration. So we talked about that it's structured, or they might use a curriculum, or um, you know, what's the goal? Is it uh, relationship focused or more? Um, and we'll look at more of that approach than two, but uh, the duration that's, you know, lasting more than 10 weeks. So, you know, what's noted in here is that most peer counseling, education, tutoring, or helping relationships are short term, um, you know, meeting a few times or for the duration of a project, but that cross-age mentoring programs typically last throughout the school year or longer, meeting weekly 20 to 40 times a year. However, 
Um, Michael noted that in one study of school-based mentoring, the average number of school-based match meetings was 10. Uh, and so looking at, you know, so then looking at that studies of mentoring programs shorter than 10 meetings were omitted from this review uh, because thinking that requiring 10 or more planned meetings seemed like a liberal, I like the, how this was phrased, but seems like a liberal minimum duration for an intervention to con constitute a mentoring relationship. So, uh, Hey, we're I'm, going to add a note on that. Sure. Uh, the 10 is completely ar arbitrary. I think um, probably 20 is a better, a better or, or yeah. more reasonable number. I chose 10 partly because um, the, the SMILE study that we conducted with adult mentors showed that, you know, the average number of meeting times was around 10 meetings, and that was for mentoring that was supposed to go all year long. If you meet every week, once a week, you can meet about 30 times a, um, a year, but there's this balance where there are some peer programs that are about eight or nine sessions that seem like they're not really mentoring as much as they are peer education. Um, and so I had to sort of come up with a sort of a, a minimum to, to cut things off because there's a lot of things that are short term that have a mentoring element. But to sort of define it, I just chose 10. I'd probably say 20 if I was to be a little bit more, you know, sort of serious. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, I liked how it was. Yeah. Okay. I like the idea that it's a liberal minimum <laughs> duration. That was good. Uh, so thinking about that, about that 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 duration. Um, so third distinction is it uh, this problem focused or remedial? So you know, is the intervention reparative, remedial, or problem focused? If so, it is not likely cross age peer mentoring. So thinking that we're focusing on that developmental friendship, character developing nature. Um, and that that's really not consistent with some of the more goal-oriented efforts. So if you're aiming primarily at improving academic skills, which is the tutoring or doing peer education or peer assistance, um, where they're helping with the personal problems, you know, and, and focusing exclusively on those things or um, addressing personal problems, doing some sort of peer counseling, um, that those things all may come up in a mentoring relationship, but that they're not entering the relationship just focused on those goals. Uh, and then the last distinction was, you know, whether or not the program is cross-age nature and putting some, um, you know, kind of some distinctions on that or, or criteria on that and that, you know, our definitions of mentor is usually an older, more experienced adult providing uh, guidance, instruction, and encouragement, or, you know, this is from um, Jean Rhodes, but whatever definition, but thinking about that older and wiser person uh, being matched, but uh, peer, there are peer mentoring programs, and I work with programs on college campuses where it's, you know, upperclassmen uh, mentoring first-year students and things like that, and that's called peer mentoring, but uh, but that there's some evidence that, um, you know, we can talk about more, that there are the larger program effects when there's at least a two-year spread in age or the mentor and mentee attend different schools, sort of elementary versus middle school or middle school versus high school. Um, so, you know, we think of the word peer and that, it can, that it's the same age. And I always used to call the circle program a peer mentoring program. And I know that the high school students didn't much care for being considered peers either. They were very sensitive to that word. So uh, it's nice to be able to, to use the term cross-age as well. Um, but knowing that cross-age mentoring programs also might refer to programs that are using older adults or elders as mentors, but um, in this particular context, thinking that the difference of in grade or, or age of, of two or more years is important. And I just thought this table was, was kind of helpful to think about, you know, what kind of program are you doing and, and to kind of plug in and think, is this really mentoring or am I doing something else to help to be able to define that? So you know, in this definition that cross-age peer mentoring programs utilize some kind of structure, meet for more than 10 meetings, um, do not focus primarily on, on problems, and want that age span of at least two years. So kind of thinking about, does your program meet that criteria? Okay, so looking at some of the benefits or positive, are there positive outcomes uh, for cross-age mentoring? And so despite limited research, which we 
we keep hearing uh, throughout all of these, uh, all of the, the webinars, we're talking about that there's limited research, but I was actually just at the Summer Institute for Youth Mentoring, and I know that it was pointed out, I can't remember which researcher shared it, but said that there's actually, can, comparatively across similar fields, that that there's quite a bit of research about mentoring or rele relevant research. So. Um, we'd like to have a lot more, or more specific to different types of programs, and that's growing. But, um, but from what we from what we do have, we can see that there are benefits for both mentees and mentors. Um, so we did, uh, there are several studies that are cited in the in the research brief, but showing that you know some different uh, outcomes for mentees. So on the left side here you know, that their attitudes toward their connectedness to school, that self-efficacy. Um, there is some impact on grades and academic achievement. Um, we've seen social skills and, and behavior problems. I mean, a decre you know, decrease or improvement <laughs> on that realm. But, and also just um, some of those gains and those attitudes towards um, antisocial behavior. So those are all the things that we, that we have seen and, and, and there are quite a few studies that are listed there, uh, and then also to look at what are some of the what some of the impact for mentors. Uh, you know that participating as a high school mentor can have positive effects, and I think that's something that you know really through the circle program, I started off. I was working with younger students and really wanted to was sort of on this. Um, uh, social work path really, and then unexpectedly was really drawn in by the work that I was doing with the mentors and with these high school students and, and tapping into that that leadership and then ended up going on this whole other youth development uh, path because of that. So seeing some of the impact that it had on them. And so some of those things were, yeah, go ahead. Could I just interject that? Um since this came out, we have a paper in the journal Professional School Counseling that came out last year on the effects for the mentors. And if any of the um, listeners would like to email me, I'd be glad to send them um, that paper if they want to use it to advocate for the utility of their program. Just email me and I'll send it to you as an attachment. Is this the one? This The uh, address? I, no, I'm showing oh, that. The, yep, oh, that there is, it is. That is it. Yeah, and I have that on a list of things that I can I'll I'll send as a um, I'll send a follow up email, and I can just attach those that you sent to me. I was just going to mention that so that there's this new study and article that you were willing to share with us because I think that's an important part of justifying the program that it has this these effects on 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 both ends absolutely. Uh, so some some similar things about connection to school. Um, you know, relating better to parents or their self-esteem again. There's some of those things, conflict resolution, responsibility. Um, um, some great effects for the mentors as well. One of the uh, teaser questions I sent out to, at least to our Minnesota programs, or if, you're, if you get our newsletter, was to uh, say who's more effective, adult mentors or youth mentors, uh, to see if there were any assumptions about that. But one of the... Um, one of the studies it cited is um, did show that in this comparison of six ran randomized studies of school-based mentoring, um, but thinking about that connectedness to school that we saw on both on both sides as a as an outcome for mentees and mentors, uh, but for the three cross-age peer mentoring programs, the effects were large, while for the three adult with youth school-based mentoring programs, the effects were small. Uh, uh, so that was just sort of interesting to think about what does that mean for about peer mentoring and that connect, connectedness to school and, and, and those pieces. But that, uh, uh, however, across the majority of other outcomes, cross-age mentors did not appear to be more effective than adult mentors. Um, I'm not sure if it's anything about them being less effective, though, either. Maybe just as effective, Michael? Is that? Yeah, the, the size of the effects weren't any larger. Yeah. Um, at some point, I guess, people, the audience is probably going to want to talk a little bit about the effects reported in the Big Brother, Big Sister uh, mm -hmm. High School Bigs program that seems to sort of fit in here and probably or could be something that people ask program coordinators about. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
Bloom would be a good time to mention that. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I thought you were just going to share that now. That would be fine. Oh. If we wanted well, to talk about that. Uh, a study came out last year. It was the second part of the study by, um, by Herrera con conducted by P Public Private Ventures. It's available at the ppv.org website. Um, and it followed the study that she had put out the year prior of the effects of the adult mentors working with youth through the Big Brother Big Sister study. And they found about eight impacts um, on attendance, truancy, um, uh, academic performance for the adults working with youth. In the report that came out in 2008 of just the high school-based program, they were only they only reported one, and that was a positive peer acceptance, or accept, peer acceptance was higher among the youth who had been mentored. So many people viewed that as really a um, sort of the absence of a real impact of that program. And I've, I feel very fortunate to have been invited to work with Kiyoki Hansen and um, Carla Herrera and several staff at Big Brother Big Sister, both to think through programmatic changes for Big Brother Big Sister, uh, and also to really look more deeply into the, uh, the data because it appears that there there are impacts of the program, but they are much more highly related to the amount of structure and recruit, recruitment and even characteristics of the mentors. Um, and I'll mention some of that in a little while, but it is fair to say that there were very limited impacts in that um, high school big study, but I think that's masked or hidden by the, the variability in the programs. Mm -hmm. And I'll describe some of that in a minute, I think, in your next slide, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, what else here? So just thinking about the outcomes are effective. There, there are some, um, you know, thinking of those very small or non-significant effects, um, that those were found, there were very small or non-significant effects found for cross-age peer programs that are enlisting middle school-aged mentors to work with elementary Age children, so some suggestion that high school mentors may be more effective than middle school age mentors. We've mentioned some of, at, you know, that maybe just the developmentally and, and maturity wise, whether or not they're ready to um, really be a mentor, thinking about where they're at. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of mentors that we'd be looking for. Um, and unclear about diff any difference in effects on mentors by age or gender. Um, there was some findings suggest that males may benefit more than females from serving as mentors, uh, but effects of programs on the middle and elementary school aged peer mentors, so thinking about them, middle school students and elementary school students as mentors or peer, helper, peer helpers are um, pretty non-significant or smaller, or smaller than the effects for high school aged mentors and helpers, which um, I think I've had conversations with people about wanting to start a program that was going to match maybe sixth graders with third graders or something like that and, you know, kind of thinking to myself that there might be, my assumption would be that there might not be as much of an impact on the third graders, but that what a great experience for those sixth graders. So that was just sort of interesting to see that, that maybe it's not having as much of an effect at that point, that older mentors might be able, again, to be to benefit more, that they may benefit the mentees more and may benefit themselves more um, through that kind of a program. Uh, so there are so, so thinking about some of these risks of cross-age mentoring, uh, and this is exactly what we, we were just saying, that left unstructured, or if the cross-age mentoring programs are, are not well supervised or monitored or kind of just um, you, you, that structured enough that they run a higher risk of causing harm, sort of playing on that risk and rewards uh, subtitle for Gene Rhodes's book, Stand By Me, um, you know, that we know that it, that our, we were committed as mentoring programs to do no harm, and we know that um, some, pro, some even adult-to-youth mentoring relationships that end too soon or end prematurely can cause more harm uh, for for youth who are involved in those relationships, so knowing that there, there's an, potentially an even higher risk of causing harm for a cross-age mentoring program. Uh, so then going through some of the things that, you know, if you supervise or monitor matches or structure the program well enough, we want to try to prevent um, some of these risks about uh, this mentors modeling deviant behavior. So. 
uh, this deviancy training that uh, this peer influence, uh, you know, and working with an older peer might be really fun for elementary and middle school mentees. They might be easier to identify with and um, want to emulate them and thinking about that role modeling, but that making sure that we're recruiting and training high school mentors so that they um, understand uh, their role as as that role model and that um, there can be some capacity if, if it's understructured or unsupervised or monitored where uh, mentors might be uh, modeling some risk-taking or authority undermining behaviors, you know, comments about teachers or, uh, you know, off-color jokes or um, things like that. So being aware of some of those risks. Uh, also with the high school students, so thinking about the harm that premature, um, prematurely ending matches uh, for even adult to youth mentoring, the, the harm that that can cause, but a failed peer match uh, could potentially have, have even, even greater harm because of that peer influence or the, this sense of, about their, their own worth or likability, attractiveness to others. It might, not, it might carry even more weight because it's coming from somebody who's closer to their age, um, so these unplanned or, or even just unexplained absences. And so then there's really some focus on, uh, you know, that those failed peer matches and, and particularly those lacking appropriate closure. So looking at, um, you know, and we'll mention this in a little bit here about the, the termination ritual, that there can be um, a formal process here down in the box that, you know, any matches in which mentors are inconsistent, you know, to think about that they should be quickly terminated, but using a formal process that can minimize those negative effects on the mentee. And we actually, um, one of the resources in the back of this particular one is a mentor-mentee termination ritual that was written by Dr. Karcher and somebody else. Oh, a former student, Kimberly Lake. Okay, there we go. But it's, so that is um, one of the items that is uh, in your resources that you can, you can easily find through um, the mentoring website, uh, through Mentor, so mentoring.org. Uh, but I have the link back there for you. And actually the link that was in the, the printed uh, version of the Research and Action Series is incorrect. So I did correct that for the PowerPoint. So you can link directly to it. Uh, but one of the things about about the the nature of school age mentoring is that the termination ritual might be easier to uh, follow through on, and it could have a really I, I would think it would have an, an impact on the mentor as well. But um, since most uh, cross age mentoring programs are run are school based, that you might it might be easier to get the mentor to follow through with that closure process than it might be for an adult who has, you know, sort of abandoned the match and it's harder to get them to connect with that student. So it might be easier to enforce and make sure that you do this sort of termination ritual or closure, closure ritual. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. So, you know, one of the things I've, I've noticed in observing programs is that, um, you know, sometimes there are kids there who don't have a mentor. Um, either their mentor didn't show up or they left. Um, I think it's real important that when kids are in a mentoring program, they have their mentor present and available and know who it is. Um, and it can be hard to tell the youth that they're going to have to leave because their match has ended. I know, I know people really wrestle with that, and so it's good to have a few backup mentors. But it's, I think it's much better to sort of deal with the problem early on than to allow an absent mentor to sort of dangle and, um, and, and not allow that to get closed up because there aren't enough mentors or, or what have you. But I, I've really, you know this in, in prior discussions, I've really you know, hammered home the importance of wrapping up the matches and that kids get very few opportunities to practice saying goodbye mm -hmm. in our society, and especially kids for whom uh, you know, uh, losses of relationships occur regularly. Uh, this can be a really powerful experience. Now, I've run up against people saying, well, I don't really want to terminate the program or terminate the match because they may want to come back at the, at the beginning of next year. Now, I, I tell them that in our camp program, we wrap up all the matches at the end of the year, and if a mentor comes back in the fall, well, yahoo, the, um, the mentee can, can rematch and they can continue on. But the, the chances of that in most programs are about 50-50, and so um, 
you're more likely to to have matches end than continue. And so, but banking on them all meeting is not really a good idea in my opinion. However, the point I wanted to bring up was that for programs that really feel like we really don't want to close the match at the end of the year for some reason, that termination ritual could also be used, and I'm adapting it to, to be called a, um, a relationship reflection, where you know once or twice or maybe three times during the year, there's a structured uh, time when the mentor mentee talk about their relationship, the strengths, the fun, and the bad times, and their feelings about that, so that if at any point, whether the mentor quits in the middle of the year or the match ends at the end of the year or somebody gets hit by a bus, God forbid, that any doubts in the youth's mind about whether they were um, valued or appreciated or whether they did something that was really offensive or um, unforgivable in the mentor's eyes, that all of those can be sort of put to rest because there's a regular sort of reflection on the relationship that, that can, act, can do the same thing as the termination ritual without having to close the relationship. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and then it, we just have a couple more slides before we get to some discussion then, too. And, and um, But thinking about this other, I just wanted to make sure I covered this last bullet here about the frustration among overwhelmed mentors. And I think, uh, you know, thinking about who we're matching, cross-age mentoring, cross-age mentors, with or who the mentees are or, um, you know, I think about the circle program and matching. I mean, these high school students had some really tough kids. And I know I did, in our program, we did a, we did a lot of things right. We did a lot of training and we did weekly support of mentors. And, and you know, there any time they, and they were on their own to meet. I mean, it wasn't during school. It was during their free time that they needed to meet. And, and many of them meeting with multiple mentees on a weekly basis so we're really on top of them and providing that support so um, it's just really interesting to me to think about 10 years later how many of them are actually working in youth development or youth fields or are my are my peers now <laughs> in, in working but but knowing that that there were those who were just frustrated and it was just more than they can handle or thinking about what was what was it that that they could deal with with their kids or you know how much help did they need from their parents even to try to sort of navigate uh, through some of those relationships. So uh, just being available and, and making sure that it's not just match and set them free, but that, that there's a really active staff person to supervise and monitor those matches. April, I'm going to give one more resource for folks. Um, yes. yes. There's a book um, by Kenneth Dodge, D-O-D-G-E, and Deshaun, D-I-S-H-I-O-N. It's, it's on the Guilford, G-U-I-L-F-O-R-D, Guilford website, and it's called Deviant Peer Influences in Programs for Youth. Deviant Peer Influences in Programs for Youth. It is the best um, summary of research and program suggestions for how to minimize the potential for deviancy training in programs like uh, peer mentoring. So I really strongly encourage anyone right. running a program with teen mentors to get this book, Deviant Peer Influences in programs for youth. Great. Um, I'll, I'll include that in the follow-up email. Oh, okay. to your, right. Yep. I just I, I have a running list of things, and then I um, just so everybody, if you don't know, then I'll send an email right after the the webinar that will uh, include all of those links for you. So if you're scrambling to write it down, just know that I will I will send that to you as well. Uh, so you know the last thing that we want to cover is some characteristics of effective cross-age peer mentoring programs, but um, and one of those pieces is this uh, developmental approach or knowing, you know, it was interesting to note sort of, you know, what happens in a cross-age mentoring program or sort of typically what, is it, what does it look like? And, uh, you know, knowing that, so uh, Dr. Karcher mentioned Kiyoki Hansen and Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, but she did some uh, descriptive evaluations of their high school bigs program um, and sort of just looking at what's the nature of the, the interactions and, um, noted that the most interesting and instructive were her findings regarding the activities, sort of what do they do when they're together, uh, but that those activities really reflect the developmental status, um, it reflect in large part the developmental status of the elementary school age mentees, so, you know, stuff that little kids like to do, um, but it also may be due uh, to that you know, unique nature of this youth with child mentoring relationship. So 
Uh, where's my thing? Okay. okay. One other thing about the, oh, yep. When, yep. You're done, when you're done with the slide. Oh, sure. Well, I just, I think the, um, when we've talked about developmental in mentoring, we often talk about the moral and styles, and I love their work. Mm -hmm. um, the term developmental can be a little bit misleading because I think they're focusing on the development of the relationship and its impact on the child's development. With, uh, with developmental mentoring with high school kids, I think we really have to think about what is it that um, the mentors need and the mentees need. And I'm, I'm just continually, continually struck by the, the need for the, the program staff to structure the batches so that the mentors feel like they are effective and understand what they're doing. And that may mean that they do um, goal-oriented activities, but those activities can really help the mentor feel more efficacious. But the flip side is the younger kids, the younger mentees, just like with adults, they want to have fun. They want to mm -hmm. feel valued and important and special and interact and play. So trying to do a balance where the high school you know, mentors don't feel like uh, they're just goofing around, and they can't imagine how this could be helpful. Um, so to give them enough structure to feel like they're, you know, making a difference, while at the same time making sure that they focus on the relationship and keep it fun is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just said in this, this piece about the fact that, um, you know, well, playing one-on-one -on -one games was related to better outcomes, that the more the match worked on academics, the less likely they were to be re were to be rematched for a second year. So sort of seeing that in action about, um, you know, on both sides, how worthwhile it feels or how much, you know, how much fun or, or thinking about what the impact of that is. Uh, but, you know, finally, these characteristics of effective cross-age peer mentoring programs, which we've sort of referred to some of these items. But, you know, if you're thinking about starting a program or if you want to gauge where you're at with your program or find places to improve, but you know, that mentors are trained in that developmental or, or relational approach, but thinking about, you know, that it's okay to focus on the relationship and the friendship and the, and the FUD and that character development, um, you know, and teaching those high school students or teaching your, your young mentors uh, about, about what that means and the value. And, and um, you know, I've introduce some of that research, or, or some of them then, if you if you do the training and talk about it, then they know that sort of intuitively, if they reflect on, you know, their own mentors or um, the adult influences in their lives or older youth that they knew when they were younger, uh, some of those pieces. But um, there's quite a bit, or, or, you know, an interesting section, too, about... Um, this mentors who report greater social interest and less and less self interest self interested motivations um, that we could recruit uh, those mentors and so uh, talking about this social interest scale that there was a, um, a study with Dr. Karcher and, and Lindwall that found high school mentors who were lower on this Crandall's social interest scale uh, were less likely to continue into a second year. Um, consistent with another one of Dr. Karcher's studies that found that mentors high in self-interest, so maybe looking for self-enhancement. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, the, the high school students who sign up just to get their uh, community service credit or something like that, um, reported lower relationship quality, where it might be, well, I've got my credit and now I'm done. Um, but those high in social interest um, were also uh, more likely to take on mentees that we're at greater behavioral and academic risk, so maybe looking to do even more, having even more of an impact, that kind of thing. Uh, but really thinking about how do you recruit or how do you design your screening for high school mentors, you know, because we're not that screening process and thinking about that holistic screening about it's not just about a background check because that's not going to be helpful with high school with young mentors, but how do you screen to find out what, what's their motivation for being a mentor and, and thinking about recruiting students who are, um, you know, really going to be interested and in, in committed to the match. Uh, again, this that the mentors and mentees differ in age by at least two years. Um, also, this piece about that mentors in high school, that we want to look at sophomores and juniors so that we can have that possibility of maybe a second year uh, beyond that beyond when they graduate, uh, or some of us know from experience that seniors sometimes 
uh, get pretty distracted or maybe um, don't have that commitment. Not across the board by any means, but um, but at least something to consider in the in the screening process. Uh, but providing again programs providing some kind of structure for the program, um, but you know keeping that focus on strengthening the relationship. So you know you can provide um, activities and and stuff for matches to do, or uh, you know different uh, worksheets or workbooks or some of the you know uh, the relationship reflection pieces, but that it's really about strengthening the relationship and keeping that focused there. Um, we mentioned the deviancy training to keep focused on, you know, keeping an eye out for that. And that's really just about good uh, match monitoring. I mean, there's a lot of these things that are, are you know, consistent with what we would recommend for um, any kind of mentoring program, but maybe um, some things to highlight for a cross-age mentoring program. Uh, but this mentee training as well is uh, something that isn't necessarily required all the time, but um, helping mentees understand how best to utilize their mentors for support. One of the things I'll send out, and some of you probably already received it, but the recent fact sheet about ongoing mentee training from uh, the uh, National Mentoring Center, the edmentoring.org, so I do have, have that to send out as well. I know mentee training is something that we're um, working on here at the Mentoring Partnership with some current and former mentees with their input and thinking about how to best prepare them uh, to use that support because then um, that can lead to some of that self-efficacy for the mentors too and, and tie into retention. If they feel like their mentees are seeking them out for support, then they feel uh, uh, more effective. So, and uh, And then as we mentioned before, the formal termination process or this relationship reflection and making sure that everybody does that so they all have that chance to practice how to say, really how to say goodbye. Uh, April, can I add two Yes, things? please. So one is on the, um, on the mentee training. Uh, Yoki mm -hmm. Hansen and Carl Herrera and I have been looking at the practices that were, um, that were most useful in the high school bigs program and one of them that has, has really stood out is when the bigs and the littles, they call them, the mentors and the mentees, are both active in selecting what they do and how they do it, mm -hmm. the impacts are stronger. They're stronger than if the kid directs what happens, if the mentor directs what happens, or if the program directs what happens. And I think in training mentees, part of it needs to be in how to you know, elicit support from the mentor, but also how to work with the mentor to collaborate to create what they're going to do and even if they're given assignments or kind of worksheets or projects figuring out how they can put their unique spin on it together seems very important mm -hmm. that's one thing and the second is um, I've been working um, with Carla Herrera Alice Davidson and Jean Rhodes um, trying to figure out which were the strongest matches in the high school base program and one of the things that has emerged is that and I think it's that it could be used when recruiting mentors um, is that the high school mentors vary in how they feel about youth in general. There was a scale in the study called Attitudes Towards Youth, how, how the mentors feel about youth in their community. Are they viewed as troublemakers or are they seen as uh, a lot of fun? And those, those uh, bigs who had higher, uh, more positive feelings about the um, children in their community who were less likely, you might say, to see them as at risk. Um, had far bigger impacts, especially for those kids who were at risk. So, and, it, and, it, and this didn't, this wasn't a function of how much time the mentors had spent uh, with kids previously or whether they had mentored in the past. It seemed to be something unique about those mentors. So when interviewing high school teens, getting a sense about how they feel about kids is a good, it seems to me maybe a good indication of how they're going to interact with their youth, especially when things get sort of when things get tense or troublesome, are they likely to fall into a, stereo, a negative stereotype towards youth, or are they likely to stick, stick it in, stick in there, and work it out with them, having a more positive view about uh, youth in general? Okay. Um, I just popped up this conclusion that maybe people could take a look at, but um, just wanted to, you know, we're really tight on time here, but we've done a lot of dialogue, some dialogue within, but. 
um, want to just give us a chance to do some some questions. Um, I've I've got some here about you know any questions or comments about um, cross age peer mentoring. Um, you know if you're currently doing cross age peer mentoring, any benefits or constraints? Um, if you're thinking about starting a cross age peer mentoring model or adding that to your program, uh, that might be. Um, something to consider, and actually, in the action section, that's that's um, there's a great um, checklist and chart and thinking about should you consider using a cross age peer mentoring model um, and some of the implications uh, uh, for different types of practice and and key considerations. So, if you're thinking a lot uh, thinking about doing that, I would definitely uh, consider that. Um, but we do have uh, some questions here, so I'm going to read the ones that are typed here. Um, but one is, is there a survey or et cetera that could be given to mentors to gauge their attitudes uh, on youth or attitudes toward youth? It's from Lisa. Someone just sent that in? Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that was great for them to pick up on that. And I hope my colleagues, um, Alice, Jean, and Carla, don't mind me mentioning these findings, but they seem so important and powerful. But uh, I've actually looked for scales that are out there. Um, the scale I'm mentioning is the, is the scale that was used uh, in the PPV study. Um, and I did a search right before we came online to find an, uh, a scale, and I haven't come across one. I think if, we, if I can come across one, I'll send it to April and have her you know, forward it to you. Um, it might just be that this is something that could be picked up through um, an essay, like I could ask the mentors mm -hmm. to describe the youth in their community and read those essays and get a sense of whether the kids hold stereotypes or feel like the youth are kind of um, tough and difficult or whether they are a joy and a joy to be around and a, you know, a blessing to be able to work with and use that as a gauge. Now the social interest scale that um, was, um, the social interest scale can be found online. If you type in Crandall social interest scale, a, uh, a website will pop up where the kids can actually enter it um, online and compute the scores right there, and then you could rank the kids. And I, and I don't use the SIS, the social interest scale, to determine who gets in the program or not. Rather, I use the SIS, the social interest scale, to figure out who's going to need what kind of support. Uh, the kids who score very high on the social interest are likely to continue, but they're also likely to get overwhelmed because they'll, they'll take on the high-risk kids. The kids who score low are less likely to take on challenging kids and are less likely to persist, and they need more support to feel involved and engaged in the program. Uh, here's a there's a something about recommendations for tr asking about any recommendations for training resources and I'll just pop up I know that there is uh, oh where did it go well, oh. while you're looking for it. Oh. oh no yeah I have got I've got your high school I don't know if you want to talk about this piece about mentor training for that the well. high school bakes yeah, I, I did this training for Big Brother Big Sister, and they've been generous to sort of leave it online and available. You'll see in here one of the things that the kids do is they complete the social interest scale, and then it um, it gives them the score and it gives them an idea of uh, how they should think about themselves if they're high or low in the social interest. So they've had this up. At some point, they'll probably take it down, um, but it uses the research that's available or was available a year or so ago to orient the um, high school mentors. It doesn't provide everything they need, uh, but it does provide good guidance, I think, on some of the key issues that will pop up. Um, I tell you, there's a, there's a pro, there's, the cross age mentoring program that we've run, I have created training materials for it, and they're going to be published next year by um, NREL, Northwest Regional Educational Lab, but they're not available yet. Um, there is a program called Peer Power, and that, that program is worth looking into. It's got several pieces of it, but part of it is the staff training uh, for guiding kids in different sorts of activities. So I would look at Tyndall's Peer Power Program, and you could probably find that on Amazon. Okay. I and I would just add to that too that I mean thinking about what's your what does your adult mentor training include, and and I think usually when I do the peer mentor training, it's kind of similar content. We're hearing the same things. Uh, but I just deliver it a little bit differently. So thinking about the adult audience versus a high school audience, so maybe more um, experiential activities uh, and things like that. That you know, I you know, at some point that 
the key considerations in the action section here, it's, it's one of the, the, the fourth one is just that cross-age peer mentoring um, is not and shouldn't be considered sort of mentoring light or seen as this easier, cheaper alternative to adult to youth mentoring, you know, that we should take it as seriously as we do, if not more seriously than we do um, our adult to youth mentoring. So, you know, just to add that to the conversation about the training. Um, I don't see any other hands up or other questions at this point. I'll just flip through the rest of the uh, just the resources so people know where to find things. And then if you if another question pops up, no problem. Um, but somebody had asked during the, the webinar about the slides for uh, these slides. And they're available before, right before the uh, uh, webinar and after at um, slideshare.com. That's the, the last one down at the bottom for this presentation and others. Um, I'm also on Delicious, so a lot of the, the links and websites can be found on my Delicious site, as well as um, I'll be doing that follow-up email with some of those pieces. Uh, again, some of the uh, resources that were included in the research brief, so this mentor-mentee termination ritual, just know that if you if you try to do the link that's in uh, the, the actual brief, if you downloaded it or if you have the printed copy, that one isn't working. I mean, you can certainly just Google and, and find it as well, but this is the correct link to that document. Uh, and and NREL um, has some great, some peer mentoring and academic success fact sheets, um, some other things that I, uh, I think the second one wasn't on the list, I added that one. And I'll also email that, that new fact sheet at just about mentee training, so thinking about how we can use that or how important that might be for cross-age mentoring. So that'll be included in the follow-up email as well. And these were the other resources that were included, in, and these are, are linked here. Um, so the, the parts that are yellow and underlined. So if you download the, the PowerPoint, you can get those links. But um, looking at the National Association of Peer Programs and also this and peer resources, I know I've looked at that quite a bit, this Canadian organization, and they have all kinds of resources for peer mentoring that you could take a look at. And uh, I'll April, also... I, yep, go ahead. Before you wrap up, can I just uh, share that? Um, I think Cindy Sturdivant, who yeah. was um, the writer of the second part of all of these uh, research briefs, really did an outstanding job in taking the research and, and uh, forcing it to be useful in practice. I mean, she was really did a masterful job. You know, I just want to give her a little bit of credit for all the hard work she did. Um, she's no longer at, at, men, at Mentor, but um, she really made a big impact with these. I also want to say I'm excited. I'll, I know I'll, uh, I'll be coming to present in yeah. Minnesota in October. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the camp program there, as well as uh, activities and school-based mentoring. But if there's, um, if there's any folks who are online who uh, would be interested in trying out some of the camp uh, material that we have uh, to try it out to give us some feedback, uh, I would encourage them to contact us because the materials, we'd love to get some folks to try them out and give us some feedback before they finally go into um, publication. Um, and so I could be reached by email if folks would like to talk about doing that. Hey, I'll, I'll include that in that follow-up email as well. That sounds great. Yeah. You'll get, probably get, I think there are 22 people online, <laughs> so you may get 22 oh. emails. Yeah, and Dr. Karcher is going to be the our, our keynote presenter. It's a really fun uh, and, and worthwhile keynote presentation in addition to two workshops. Uh, you're going to be very tired at the end of the day, I think, but two workshops on school-based mentoring and also on cross-age peer mentoring. So if you, uh, registration is uh, is up and running and, and open online, and the deadline for early bird registration is September 14th. So uh, if you can travel to come here, if you're in Minnesota and are, and are going to come, then um, we hope to see you there. Uh, the next webinar is coming up in just a few weeks. We had, this one was delayed a little bit, so we've got September 2nd with Andrea Taylor uh, looking at mentoring across generations, so engaging 50-plus adults as mentors. And I had the opportunity to meet Andrea face-to-face -face at the Summer Institute for Youth Mentoring, and she uh, is a great presenter and I know is, is really excited about this and has already been talking about different slides that she wants to contribute and, and things like that. So um, be sure to, uh, if you're not already registered for that one, to jump in and get registered for that 
as well. Another version of Across Age Mentoring. Yeah, April, it might be worth mentioning that her program, The Across Ages, she's written a really wonderful book on it that you can get from Amazon, too. But um, it's one of the few programs that's listed on uh, What Works Clearinghouse and it's one of the few mentoring programs that's really demonstrated, documented um, impacts. So it's worth getting to know that in case you're trying to get funding for programs um, that require you to have evidence-based uh, interventions. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Um, well, thanks, everybody. I did, and just so you know, I'm also, I've been re recording some of these webinars, but our, our website currently doesn't just, we just don't have the capacity to post them yet, so we're, we're still working on how we can break them up into different parts and, and get them available uh, online for people who maybe missed it, but, um, you know, keep, stay posted and keep your eyes peeled for, for that, and thank you so much for participating. I'll send the follow-up email. If you have other questions, feel free to send those my way or you'll have Michael's email and you can you can ask questions that way as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Karcher and uh, Thank you, April. We'll see you in October. Yeah. Great. It'll be fun. Thanks everybody. Bye -bye.